Ah, uh, yes. Pokemon Sword and Shield. The games that have launched years of controversy and arguments on both sides of the spectrum, splitting fans apart. People yelling about the dex cut, the less than stellar graphics, the uh, less than stellar story, and much more. Uh, while I won't be talking about what I think about these controversies, I will however be talking about my opinions on the DLC Game Freak released in the past year. Some people think that these DLCs were just simple cash grabs, I personally see these DLCs as something more and hope for you guys who feel like the series is in danger. Because uh, it's really not, you're just being angsty. Some fans of the series have been categorizing the generations of Pokemon to try to tell how the games have been changing. Some people have dubbed these the good games, being generations 1 through 5, and the bad games as Gen 6, 7, and 8. I personally think that's just wrong and patronizing to those who enjoy the later gens. Instead, how about this chart here? Here we have the Pokemon as an idea games, generations 1 and 2. Then there's the Pokemon as a series games, Gens 3 through 5. And then finally, modern day Pokemon as the remainder of the generations. The first two games didn't have much substance that the rest of the games have, given the first game was them putting out their idea of a monster capture game that appealed to everyone. Looking at you, Shin Megami Tensei, I don't want to summon demons. <laughs> it worked, and I mean it worked. <laughs> They were out here like, oh, so people like our game, like a lot. Um, should we make another game? They made the second game just to make it. <laughs> like Pokemon exploded in popularity, and they had to keep up. Then with the third game came the phase where they saw Pokemon could be something more than a '90s fad. It could be its own series. Then they started world building, having creation myths, and even questioning the morals of the Pokemon universe. Then with the 6th generation onwards, they've been trying to take a more modern approach to the series, adding a unique mechanic or gimmick to draw in new and returning players, almost something like you would see something like Mario, or Legend of Zelda do, or Kirby, uh, some of the more Nintendo franchises. Uh, in this case, things like Mega Evolution, Z-Moves, Regional Variants, and Dynamax most recently. The fans have been on a slippery slope for the past few generations. While some have been enjoying the new games which I have dubbed the future Pokemon games, but rather than talk about everything at once about the generations that people either are enjoying or they're hating, um, let's separate everything into by generation with all the different complaints and things that people didn't like about each generation one way or another. So for Generation 6, there's quite a bit of things people didn't like about X and Y. One of the biggest ones that nearly everyone will agree is with the lack of difficulty. Those games were the easiest in the series by far, even if you turned the EXP share off. All the gym leaders were honestly quite forgettable, the story was less than stellar, and making sure that you were nearly guaranteed to catch the your box legendary no matter what. Like, if you knocked out Xerneas or Evelto, it would get back up and fight again. And a lot of people would end up saying that, oh, I caught this thing in a regular Pokeball on my first try. It's like, that's not supposed to happen for a legendary fight. <laughs> but then, for Generation 7, a lot of people don't like some of the things about Gen 7, but in my honest opinion, I don't think Sun and Moon had anything bad about it that valid people validly complain about. Yeah, the XP share was still around, but it was less overpowered than in Generation 6. I had it turned on and I still had difficulty in parts of the game. Uh, some people <laughs> complained about the amount of dialogue you have to go through, which I think is total bull. Like, what else do you expect from a JRPG? Uh, of course it's going to have a long dialogue. <laughs> However, the biggest issue people have with Generation 7 is the Ultra games, Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. They barely change much compared to the originals, only changing how the climax of the game happened, which even at that point didn't make sense why they changed it and the changes didn't make sense and that's about it a lot of people didn't like the alternate dimensions thing that they were going for the generation with ultra bees and ultra wormholes and alternate dimensions and alternate universes but for me personally i was all for it <laughs> i really liked the ultra beast and i'm honestly hoping that they make more in the future but again this isn't about me this is about the complaints 
And then, Gen 3. Oh boy. Where do I start? <laughs> On that fateful day of E3 2019, when they dropped the bomb that started the chaos, announcing that there will be no national Pokedex. Then the other complaints trickled in. No graphics overhaul. No animation overhaul. Accusing developers of being lazy the whole nine yards. While most of these were valid criticisms, some of the things people would say in a ledge were just straight up wrong. Like there was someone who tried to make false allegations towards the developers to cancel them. And people were harassing, Ma you know, Jinichi Masuda, uh, one of the top people in at Game Freak. They were harassing him on his birthday, asking him about the National Dex, and he went off on them on Twitter. <laughs> I'm like, y'all need to leave this man alone. <laughs> He's just a man. <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> but like, why did these recent games end up this way? In my opinion, it's really not that hard to explain. They just didn't have the proper time for such a jump. It's theorized that the games originally were worked on with 3DS hardware, and it could be a possibility. But if I feel like if that was true, then we shouldn't even be complaining all that much. Let me explain about it for a bit. One thing people sometimes forget is that Game Freak has been nearly exclusively working with handheld hardware for over 20 years. People were expecting Breath of the Wild levels of craziness when we got word that we were getting the first mainline Pokemon game on a console. But that simply cannot be possible within the time frame that they probably were working on the game. So it was only natural that the graphics weren't going to look the best. The team is still learning how to get more used to more powerful hardware. Now, people will turn to Let's Go, which released before Sword and Shield, and say, hey, that game looks way better than Sword and Shield and came up before them. While, yes, it is true, we actually don't know how long Let's Go was in development, Sword and Shield could have been worked on a long time while well, Let's Go had a smaller development cycle using the same engine as Generation 8, which I believe is already in. I think, I think it, th I'm pretty sure Let's Go was in the same engine as, as Sword and Shield, um, but don't quote me on that. Uh, but we just won't know. Like, the content after Sword and Shield, however, can show us something. The DLC that they released in 2020 shows that they were improving from what they had in the base game even though it's in small steps. So the Isle of Armor gave us a glimpse of what Game Freak wants the future of Pokemon to be, being a seamless fully 3D map with camera control. Obviously that's something that is needed for the, that, you know, that we needed for such a long time, you know, with modern RPG games like Xenoblade or Dragon Quest already doing this for a while. But this is something that we needed for the, for the entire game, um, but having a few areas that are full war, wild areas is a way to show that they are at least getting used to this new way of developing 3D Pokemon games. But then the second DLC is where I feel it shows that all the worries that we, that we as the vocal part of the fan base, have been having about that. I feel like that these worries can be a bit lightened. The Crown Tundra was really something. Like, I honestly didn't expect much from this DLC. But I've had much more enjoyment with this area than I had the main game. Everything about it was stellar to me. So first, let's talk about the story. The very beginning of Calyrex's story honestly shocked me. Like I did not ever expect a person to be taken under control by a Pokemon and have a Pokemon talk to the player directly on a regular basis in the main series game. I think the only time I can remember a Pokemon talking to the player was in Sun and Moon with Tapu Koko telling the player it is time when they visit the ruins after becoming champion. But the characters in this DLC also had tons of personality, what with Peony and Peonia, uh, you know, being a rec being recurring character with different interactions. And like, the main thing b about this in the story of the quote-unquote, that it reminded me of the quote-unquote old game freak, which was the legends and secrets of the Crown Tundra. Remember back in Generation 3 when no one told you about how to unlock the Reggies or Mirage Island? Or how about in Generation 4 where there was lore everywhere in the region? How about the post-game facilities and challenges that have different battles? Or the fact that there were extra legendaries in general to find and catch? The Crown Tundra has all of this. There are many things that you aren't told about when you happen to walk into the area. 
Traveling to a narrow path set by the dining tree, you can, unlo you can unlock a spirit tomb encounter after talking to multiple players online. Shaking the dining tree itself multiple times can have you fight a Dynamax Gradient. You can also catch the mythical Keldeo after catching the Swords of Justice, even, and you're even able to catch a level 100 Dynamax Regigigas, but only if you have all the Regis in your team. And then in terms of lore, there's many texts that you can read about Calyrex in the history of the Tundra in the Mayor of Freezington's house. Uh, you can have Peony give you details about the legendary Pokemon that you catch or need help catching. And then there's even slabs of stone and pedestals all around the area talking about Calyrex and the their steed, depending on which one you picked. And, if you, and pretty much the history of the Crown Tundra if you look hard enough in the areas for them. With these extra things to do also, they added the Dynamax Adventures as a new way to catch legendaries, as they, this is a thing they've been doing since Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, along with making it co-op and having higher shiny rates for those that, you know, like shiny hunting, because they know there's a big market for that. Then there's also the Galarian Star Tournament, a multi-battle tournament, where you get to team up with characters in the game and see all these unique character interactions, like seriously. Some of this makes all the characters feel much more fleshed out and lets me understand the personality more. Like, <laughs> I can't, still can't get out of my head that um, Milo and Alistair are like, are like a, have like a brotherly relationship. It's beautiful. And then we can't also forget about the battle facility from the Isle of Armor being restricted sparring. No one really talked about it, but it is a new battle facility that we've never had before compared to something like the Battle Factory or something. It almost reminds me of the Battle Dome from Sinnoh, which you were uh, you were only restricted to one Pokemon, and you would always you would uh, choose to fight Pokemon of different types. Kind of, it was kind of similar to something like that. But then we get to the big part, which is the legendaries. Generation three, four, and five. We're really making legendaries left and right for players to catch and discover. Yeah, we already knew about Calyrex, the new Regis, and the Galarian boards, but we weren't told how to get them, and then <laughs> that wasn't even all the legendaries. We got two new horse legendaries for Calyrex to fuse with, <laughs> and boy, their themes when you fight them are such a banger. <laughs> Have you heard some of these? Like, listen. Speaking of, a lot of the new legendary themes gave me heavy vibes of the past generations. I mean, like, they were really good. And like, they even gave us the Swords of Justice to catch by finding their footprints, which was a very nice surprise. I didn't expect that, honestly. I mean, I kind of had a small theory previously that we might see the Swords of Justice because I thought it was interesting that those were one of the few um, legendaries not in the Pokedex that they allowed in competitive battles. So I was like, that was a little interesting, but I guess it was kind of a, like a small hint. But all of this is just showing to me that Game Freak never lost their touch. They're still there. The only thing that, <laughs> that they needed is more time to make something they really wanted to do for the future of the series. You may still be salty about the lack of national decks, which you shouldn't, or upset about a stupid tree <laughs> that really has no impact on gameplay whatsoever, but you're still missing the big picture here. Instead of looking at what was going on almost three years ago and most likely was in development at least a year or two more ago, how about you look at what's been done now and what could be done to improve the series further? With the 25th anniversary already here, I'm personally excited for what's to come.